I'm Mamta Dadlani. I'm also a member of Division 39 and pretty involved um, with Section 9 um, in various capacities. Um, I take she, her pronouns, and I thought um, we would start with me, Carter, and Brianna both doing little introductions about who we are. Um, and then what we'll do from there is Brianna will present a summary of the paper, a very brief summary of the paper, which hopefully all of you had a chance to read. Um, and then Carter and Brianna will have a conversation with some questions that the three of us have explored to delve a little bit deeper into some of the themes that we felt were important, particularly around the division's movement towards anti-racist work and thinking about psychoanalytic thinking in that vein. Um, and then after that, we'll begin a more larger interactive Q&A. Um, and that'll be a little bit more experimental using the chat function, um, playing with mics and whatnot. Um, so, I'm Mamsa Dadlani, like I mentioned, take she, her pronouns. Um, I have a private practice in uh, Berkeley, California, and I focus very much on social justice issues. Most of my practice deals with issues of race, gender, sexuality, and immigration. Um, and I do more and more organizational consultation, helping organizations think about the ways that racism shapes who's present and how they're present, whether that's training institutes, and larger organizations um, like Division 39. Within the division, I'm also co-chair of the Dialogues Across Difference Task Force, um, which was started by me and our colleague, Corey Bennett, um, several years ago in response to some experiences that both of us had within the division that were really making it an unwelcoming space. Um, and through that work as queer folk, folks of color, we really, um, had some really exciting experiences, this being you know, one, of, one of the ones that the division as a whole is moving into. Um, so you'll hear a lot more about the dialogues work as the conference approaches. Um, and let's see, um, some of my areas of interest in working have to do with um, coloniality. It's more and more part of how I'm thinking about the work. And so as we talk today, I know that's one of the lenses I'll be using, as well as um, counter-transference and use of self in therapy. So that's a little bit about me. Um, Carter and Brianna, would you like to introduce yourselves? Brianna, you're the important one here. Do you want to go? Sure. Now that I finally figured oh! out how to get a camera <laughs> working. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm really just excited. I'm figuring this out on my phone and looking through and seeing folks who have joined and recognizing a lot of friendly faces, which is really great. Um, for those of you who I do not know, my name is Brianna Suslovic. Um, I am currently a forensic social worker in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I got into my house 10 minutes ago and would have been able to do more tech prep, but I was in a lobby day for bail reform in New York. So if anyone wants to talk about that, we definitely should. Um, but at this point, um, I am very excited to be able to share this paper with you all um, to get some feedback um, and also to hopefully just generate some uh, productive discussion um, about the role of race in my own social work training um, as someone who did a pretty clinical and psychoanalytic um, social work training program and is now Division 39 scholar and considering how I can continue to build psychoanalytic um, theory and praxis into my work in the criminal legal system. All right, Carter, your turn. Hello, I'm Carter Carter. I'm a charter member of the Brianna Fan Club. Um, so what's my deal? Uh, I teach at Smith and Leslie, uh, uh, very involved in the division. I'm the president of section nine now and uh, co-chair of MCC where I was also a scholar, uh, so this is a MCC Scholar Fest at the moment. Um, and a, a lot of my, my private practice in Amherst focuses mostly on like serving people of color, particularly multiracial people. A lot of my academic stuff is about multiracial issues. I'm a multiracial person, but the, the other kind of branch of the work that I'm doing is, is basically about white aggression, <laughs> in, in essence. Um, so uh, I'm doing a big study right now about the role of whiteness in school shootings in the U.S. Um, and just thinking a lot about how like the relationship between whiteness and aggression and how that happens in like big ways and small ways, but how it's all consequential and sucks. I guess would be the synopsis there. Um, <laughs> Great. So, so be before we hop into the next piece, and Carter, I hear that you were about to say something. Um, also want to let folks know that in the chat fun function, you can chat me directly. 
And so if there is anything that you want to have said or recognize in the process, also feel free to do a private chat to me as well. Okay, just notice that function. Carter, were you gonna say something there? Oh, no, I was just gonna say, if we're starting off with Brianna giving a brief synopsis, right? Yes, so we're gonna move into the next piece, Brianna talking a little bit about the paper and then into the conversation with the two of you. And I see numbers increasing, so for those who are joining, um, there's a chat function at the bottom and you can put in comments questions to the whole group and I'll be picking up those themes as we move into the later part of the conversation. And if you have a technical difficulty, feel free to um, chat me directly so that the moderators and Brianna can um, keep the discussion moving smoothly. All right. You ready, Brianna? You're muted, Brianna. Thank you so much. Um, so at this point, um, I'm happy to run through a sort of brief um, overview of some of the themes in the paper. Um, just, you know, refreshing folks who have had a chance to read the paper and also giving everyone else an opportunity to um, just get a little bit of context about what I've written. Um, so the paper that I wrote is based on uh, my second year internship and some of the experiences clinically and personally that I was having during that time. Um, I was interning at a community mental health center and I had um, the real pleasure of uh, meeting a client who I call Brian in my paper in the, I think, first or second week of my internship. Um, so Brian is someone who um, incidentally resembled my own younger brother um, and was similar in age to my own younger brother. Um, he was multiracial like myself. Um, he was also half black and half white, um, but I think our identities diverged in a lot of really significant ways, um, namely that he um, had come from a very different socioeconomic situation than me. Apologies for my dog in the background um, making noise. Um, and he, in a lot of ways, I think had a number of life experiences that were very different from my own, um, was completely unfil unfamiliar with what therapy could look like. Um, and I was, you know, sitting across the room from him in our early sessions, um, recognizing like that there was a huge gap despite a lot of the visual similarities between us. Um, I think the paper that I've you know, been focusing um, on in different iterations that some of you may have heard me read or present at other paper, at other conferences, um, focuses on the theme of racial loneliness, which is um, just a, I guess, theoretical framework uh, that I'm sort of trying to build or work through um, that touches mainly on the fact that I think as um, people of color, um, within majority white spaces, there's often this um, feeling of profound loneliness um, that I think can be understood through psychoanalytic terms that already exist for us, um, whether that be Kleinian theory or um, racial melancholia or any other number of um, connections that I probably haven't even made yet. Um, but I think in understanding the reaction that I received from um, colleagues and also from supervisors in understanding racial loneliness in my own experience um, that year. Um, a lot of the working through that I've been doing since that year has been um, figuring out what happened between myself and the client, uh, what happened between myself and supervisors, and what, what happened between myself and colleagues. Um, given that I was the only Black woman trainee at my community mental health agency, my colleagues and my supervisors were predominantly white. And here I was with this client who in some ways resembled me and other ways didn't um, without much of a space to think or talk through those ideas. Um, so the purpose of the paper is partially just to continue to have those conversations after the fact. Um, and I'm really hoping to learn a lot from the folks who are on tonight's call as well. So that's my very broad overview. Cool. You want to talk about it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we have some questions that like I, I we were bouncing off each other by email a little earlier. So like uh, I, I, there's I'm going to kind of go through that a little bit. But I, I reread this a couple of times today, your paper. And there there's this there was this passage that kept jumping out to me about like how racial loneliness feels. And, and you kind of like articulate a lot of these like affective emotional valences. But one thing that I just kept thinking was like, loneliness feels unsafe, mm -hmm. right? 
And like, I feel like that sense of unsafeness was like kind of sub rosa in the whole text. And mm-hmm. it, it's something where like, I was uncharacteristically nervous coming into today. I'm not a nervous person generally, but I, I felt a sense of like, ooh. And, and I'm realizing that there was like a, a counter transference that comes mm-hmm. up when thinking about this topic that's about that issue of like unsafeness. So does mm-hmm. that like, does that scan to you? Like, does that sound fair? Absolutely. I think that's totally fair. And I think that um, one of the interesting ways that I've been trying to understand safety, especially relative to my job now, where I feel actually very safe, you know, despite the fact that I'm in jails and courts all day, like <laughs> that's I, saying something, right? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think that the amount of relative safety that I feel in my current position has a lot to do with the fact that I don't feel either hyper visible or invisible. Um, because I think that those are both times where I, as a person of color in a white space, have felt um, in some way threatened or like challenged in a negative way. <laughs> Um, and so I, I do think that some of it comes back to this frame of safety. And then I think the other frame that's been useful in trying to understand where this feeling of loneliness might be anchored is, um, like this idea of who's visible, who's not, who's being erased and who's being like almost targeted in a visibility way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear that for sure. And like, so the the segue there, I guess, is like, for me, oh, hello. Um, (laughs) one of the one of the big themes that you're exploring in this text right is the idea that like you and brian in your brief work together like you're two like really complex people your racial identifications are complex your like intersectional identities and like how all these you know the particular pieces of your experience and your social location like make you are complicated right and and nuanced and would take a lot to unpack and so much of what's happening in this training experience and in these supervisions is like flattening you. Like I'm almost imagining like smoothing you out as a screen, like smoothing mm-hmm. out the screen for the white projections. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right. And, and so like part of what I, th- I think you begin to speak to, but it's like useful to like really stipulate to it is like, what's your understanding of like what was being projected? Like by these organizations, by these individuals, what, what did they want to evacuate and attribute or, or assign to, to you? Too. And probably it's something right. Maybe, but. right. Um, so I think one of the um, really clear moments where this uh, happened uh, was in an individual su- supervision um, with one of my uh, supervisors. All three of them were like middle aged or older white women. Um, and I think that the projection that I now am able to understand that may have been happening in that moment um, comes out of something that the supervisor said about my client. Um, she was talking about this client. The client was talking about, you know, being um, on the street with his girlfriend. He found a stray dog. Um, he, you know, he decided to take this dog in. The supervisor asked what kind of dog. He said, oh, it, it, he said to me, you know, it was a mutt. And so I conveyed that to my supervisor. And she said, oh, so he's the mutt. His girlfriend is the rescuer. Um, and in that moment, I realized that, like, she was not seeing me as someone who in any way resembled his racial identity, but instead as like a fellow white clinician, um, or at least that was my read on the situation. Um, So I think there are these moments where uh, you're not even really invited into whiteness uh, as a person of color, or especially as a multiracial person who maybe passes as white in some contexts, like you're not invited in, you're sort of pulled into whiteness. Um, So that was very jarring for me. And I think that the like, implications of that for my supervisory relationship were really horrible in that I then felt like I couldn't actually join. I had a very strong reaction against that. Um, so I think being pulled in that direction is one is one experience I had in, you know, trying to get feedback and supervision on this case. The other experience is, you know, uh, more directly, I think, being lumped in um, to some sort of like ambiguous category that was never named but like was clearly conveying like oh like you are over identifying with him because you're a person of color um I don't know that experience and I don't have any expertise to offer you on that like that's something else that I you know I can't really help you with um so I think that the experience of you know 
in one direction getting pulled toward like this dominant identity and dominant narrative and dominant uh, clinical perspective in our field is, is one experience. And then the other experience is being pushed completely out of that um, and being told like also that there's not room in my clinical supervision hour to get consultation on that uh, component of my work with this client. Yeah. So there's this like amazing one, two punch where they're like, well, we can't really do that, but also you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I think I ended up spending quite a lot of time in my year um, after this client who, you know, showed up a few times, uh, didn't feel like therapy was for him at the time, yeah. didn't, you know, for whatever reason, like didn't come back. Um, but I think that I dwelled on this client for the entire year because it really set a tone um, mm. of what I could expect from my supervisors and what I could expect from my colleagues in terms of their understanding of me and their understanding of clients who maybe looked like me or shared some things in common with me that felt very like tender and vulnerable um, because I am, you know, a person who grew up uh, with a particular racial identity and is still working through a lot of that. Um, so yeah, I think that the the projections are like really, really stark um, in this particular role. Um, my dog is em empathizing. Um, and I think also like the understanding of blackness and whiteness uh, with this particular case and this particular supervision feel like very, much a part of everything as well. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Carter, can I hop in for a second? Yeah. I think there's there's sort of two things I hear you say that I heard echoed in your your paper, Brianna, which is you were invited in, but only in a particular way, and that there was an interpolation of you into whiteness as the way to get access to your training, right? And like the only the only way to get access to supervision was to do it in this particular way. The other thing I hear is that there was a disavowal of your supervisory environment not quite knowing what to do, which is, I think, also something that happens when whiteness becomes decentered, is there's a, a scattering of sorts. And I think I also heard themes of that in your paper as well. Absolutely. And yeah, I think the sort of discombobulated feeling of not knowing where to even bring this client for supervision at a certain point like comes from this feeling of um not like any sort of outright hostility or rejection um but instead this feeling of like where do i fit within the schema of whiteness or blackness since there are no other options being made available yeah and you know, we were we were talking a little bit on email about like where anti-blackness like specifically like not sort of racism in a generic sense but like a particular like i don't what's the word i want like a kind of a symbolic fixation on blackness and like an effort to like imagine blackness in a certain way in order to like construct whiteness in a certain way like that seems really key here and it, it's it, do, do Tell me if I'm understanding this correctly from your point of view that like this is an institution that at a cultural level and at the level of the individual who individuals who constitute it like they're real invested in the institution being white i.e being good i.e prestigious i.e you know worthy scientific all these things that are like get attributed to whiteness and they need blackness to be the kind of counterpoint foil that's outside that's not part of the, mm -hmm. of the body of the institution and its membership so like here you are like being a multiracial person with like multiple complex racial identifications but where blackness is maybe this sort of potentially totalizing one unless they like whitewash you as a way to mm -hmm. be like, no, 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 no no like it's neutralizing you and making you safe in some way but to do right. that, make Brian like the locus of blackness that has to be kept out in some way. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that like within that, there's like even more nuance that we can add to the dynamics of maybe organizational anti-blackness and that I think the way that whiteness often functions in, you know, excluding kinds of blackness, in controlling other kinds of blackness, in eliminating kinds of blackness, like all of those come from this idea of blackness as 
you know, having to be unidimensional um, or having to be something that's only acceptable in its like closest to whiteness form. Um, and I think that I happen to fit the kind of blackness um, as someone who is, you know, well-educated, uh, has like middle-class uh, or upper middle-class sensibilities, um, knows how to speak in psychoanalytic terms about my feelings and experiences. Like those are all things that were valued because of the sort of dominant white culture of the organization that I was in. Um, along with like the sort of like overwhelming urge to control and manage uh, individual people in the organization um, and individual sort of understandings of identity. Can, can you unpack that last part a little bit more? Yes. Um, so I think that the way that this organization understood identity was very much coming from this sort of multicultural place. Oh. One second. I'm just going to get this dog out of my, my room. <laughs> um, so I think, um, I think the understanding of identity within the organization was very much from this multicultural uh, power is removed from the equation uh, way of seeing things. And I think that in many ways leads to um, an understanding of um, people of color in the organization that's predominantly white as, as tokens and as people who help the organization look like a good organization because now they have diversity, um, they have, you know, this full understanding of um, all the complex ways that people can identify and show up, but like the power dynamics surrounding those identifications um, and identities are not often delved into as much. Mm -hmm. So it's like, to the extent that people of color are like invited into the organization, it's like part and parcel of cosmopolitanism almost, right? Where it's like, we have all kinds of people here, but there's a lack of incident to like, but you only get to be here if you act some kind of way. Exactly. And I noticed in the chat that that's also being reflected, that that's very much, you know, something that's, um, I think, under discussed, um, but that I would love to see more of is like the sort of loneliness that comes out of being a palatable person of color for a white dominated space but then feeling incredibly alienated as a person of color in POC spaces mm. um, because of, I guess, I, yeah, I mean, I think part of it is code switching. I think part of it is not feeling grounded in a like core ego sense of self that I think is often like easily accessible to white people who are not um, thinking about how they're perceived all the time through this racial lens because whiteness in addition to functioning like because of the existence of anti-blackness also functions like best as this invisible norm that's under discussed yeah yeah and, and you know, invisible to whom right like yeah that is, <laughs> for the defense like i mean if we're seeing whiteness is basically like a, a complex constellation of defenses that like are used to keep certain feelings at bay and certain power relations intact. Like everybody needs the defense to like be operating out of awareness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, so which gets it gets me to this question too of like, and I think this is a question, you know, that we can play out and that is one that I think this audience is probably gonna have a lot to say about this, is like, how do we resist that in a way that is is feasible, right? Because mm -hmm. This is intolerable emotionally to live in this way, right? Like, mm -hmm. if we're going to be clinicians who are doing like open hearted work, if we're going to be like, you know, building organizations and teams that like do really good practice, we can't be like constantly defending or like protecting ourselves from these onslaughts. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet, like, resistance is really fraught, right? Because there's nothing that gets you on the wrong side of whiteness quicker than pointing out when whiteness is operating. And, right. And when you bring the defense into conscious awareness, it, that resistance or that, like, you know, you know, compensatory response comes crashing down on you, potentially. So, mm -hmm. like, I, I wonder, like, what you think, and then maybe we can turn this to other everybody later, is, like, what are strategies for resisting that that feel doable? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, something that was very useful to me when I was in this internship was a clinician of color um, consultation group that had started up. Um, and I think that that was a very like productive space for me to get supervision on this client and to feel validated in like the work that I had started to do and also to, you know, have a place where I could trust that I was not going to have my client and by some extension me as like a, a mutt. Um, <laughs> so like that sort of like risk was removed from the equation because of sort of the utility of having, um, some sort of common sensibility with the other people of color in this clinician consultation group. Um, that's one way that I think is useful to resist. Um, I think on an organizational level, there are lots and lots and lots of ways that um, good white organizations um, try very hard to bring in people of color in ways that I think further alienate people of color. Um, and I think that that comes in the form of tokenism or it comes in the form of sort of like, I don't know if false advertising is the right word, but almost, you know, marketing it, marketing yourself as a place that is aware of diversity and multiculturalism um, and maybe even unconscious bias, but is not linking any of those things to existing power structures in any meaningful way, mm -hmm. such that the general dominant white culture of an organization, um, whether that's, you know, things that are talked about in the break room or, um, the way that clients are discussed in case consultation meetings, like all of those things, I think very much contribute to um, the experience of people of color being brought into an organization without the organization being prepared to like hold, nurture and support them in the work that they're doing. It also comes in the form of white clinicians, uh, I think not wanting to take responsibility for um, working with clients of color. Yeah. Um, wanting to refer uh, clients of color to all the clinicians of color such that the clinicians of color are overwhelmed and overworked and um, then also not getting adequate supervision on that work. Um, so I, I think that those are some of the sort of dynamics that are obviously very much a part of a lot of organizations growing processes and a lot of organizations processes of transforming into an organization where racial justice is very much at the forefront of um, the work that can be done clinically. Um, I think in my current position, I'm not doing clinical work, um, but I am surrounded by a mix of colleagues who are um, doing this work from a place of lived experience and from um, sort of this uh, understanding that like we actually cannot know our clients' experiences um, because of the privilege that we hold educationally, the privilege that we hold with our place of employment. And, and so the question isn't how do we bridge this gap and be good privileged clinicians? The question is how can we work with this gap and acknowledge it appropriately with our clients such that the burden doesn't fall on clients or on the people who are closest to directly impacted who are employed at my organization? Um, that means that there are a lot more people of color working at my organization to begin with. And so the question of who is starting conversations about race, where the conversations are getting located, um, like being sort of aware of like Sarah Ahmed's idea of the feminist killjoy and like <laughs> translating that over into like the problem person of color in a clinical meeting who asks a question about race or asks the racial identity of the client and the clinician when they're not named, um, like that sort of like locating the problem in the person of color can't happen at an organization where there's more parity and people of color are not leaving because they actually feel comfortable uh, doing this work and knowing that they're going to be supervised and supported in it by, for example, in my case, an amazing woman of color who's my supervisor. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. there's a way where like what you're describing with your current internship was which is like a context that would not be seen as like traditionally psychoanalytic even though i think you're doing deeply analytically oriented work there like if that's like an uh a, a place that psychoanalytic institutions could aim for right like mm -hmm. like kick ass if we could mostly be a lot more like that right mm -hmm. one of the things that i'm hearing you pointing to as a barrier is that like 
we a lot of analytic organizations get to this place where they 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 know enough about racism being bad that they go well we should not maybe be racist and so we should have brown people but there's not a kind of self-searching like preparatory effort to think about like gee what would this place need to be like in order for people of color to actually not hate it here right yeah I think that, you know, my organization that I'm at now also just hired a director of diversity and inclusion, which is this like financial and tangible commitment to having like a person similar, I think, to the role of like Mamta in this conversation, who's like a process observer and who can offer insights that I think are often difficult for people of color who are not being paid or, you know, formally tasked with doing that to, to be responsible for. Um, so I think that that's like one tangible option. I think that there are problems with that as well. And the idea that, oh, we're locating all of these problems in like a formal paid person. It doesn't fully eliminate the issue of that like projection. Um, and then I think a lot of cases, the defensive response of, um, like white people in power in an organization to not make it their problem, but make it somebody else's, um, when it's about race. Um, so I, do, I definitely don't have perfect answers, but I think that, you know, part of the way that I understand psychoanalysis as something that could survive um, and something that could thrive in, you know, communities like the ones that I'm working in um, is to understand that, like, using a strictly analytic way of thinking or an analytic frame means, in some cases, foregoing um, creative ways of thinking about power, uh, creative ways of thinking about um, difference uh, in creative ways of thinking about identity more broadly. Um, and so why would we miss all of those opportunities by sticking to dead white male theorists um, who, again, have offered a lot to me, um, but who have not offered all that I know and all that I think about psychoanalytic work? Um, how can we potentially how can we potentially expand the, the frame of our thought and practice beyond what we currently have, theoretically, um, to then make a space intellectually feel more welcoming to people who are not coming from that, from that specific training? Totally. And I think, like, I mean, that's the question that launched a thousand ships, right? But the, part of what it, the, it brings up for me is like, why is it that we don't regard an analysis of racial identity and experience it's like a normative part of every analytic piece of work like mm -hmm. how is that not a standard issue like a standard issue part of every super every supervision right i mean we know why because racism right? mm -hmm. but, but as a kind of like creed occur thing like the all so much of like rich material is like tied up encoded like object relationally associated with like these social locations and identities and experiences that it just is it's such a devastating loss for everybody that we don't do it's not to all lives matter but like i do think it's a loss mm -hmm. there, there's a piece though that i, I did want to like i wanted to check with you if, like if i'm hearing you right that part of what being in an organization like your current one makes possible is that like it you can have like a complex consideration of the way that your intersecting identities shape the work Right, mm -hmm. like that, you can have a real, a, a real like reflective process about like. So, I'll speak for myself, and then because I don't want to make it about you if you don't think it's right for you. Like, mm -hmm. I'm a multiracial person. I have a complex relationship to whiteness. Right? Mm -hmm. Am I white? What do we mean by that? Right? Like, yeah, but no, but yeah, but no, and y y I've not been in a professional environment where there was a space to reflect on that kind of ambivalent identification or complex identification and it sounds like being in your kind of setting with the values it has and the concrete like people who are in the room makes that kind of thing more possible mm -hmm. yeah and i think the beautiful thing about my job now is that my colleagues very much appreciate that i came from a really clinical background and they want to talk psychoanalytic theory with me and they want to understand their clients through psychoanalytic lenses um, and we're all doing this work from a place of like, how can we best advocate for clients who are accused of crimes in Brooklyn? <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's a very different objective um, than a traditional clinical environment. But 
I think that the work that I'm doing inevitably involves managing and doing what I can to aid and witness clients healing from trauma, um, given that I think most court involvement for my clients is traumatic. Um, and I, I think that that is where it's really, really beautiful for me to be in a place where I can, I can bring both sides of my brain, if that makes sense, um, where I'm getting to think analytically and getting to even sometimes write analytically about my clients in ways that I think help judges and prosecutors to understand them as people who have early life experiences that are now relevant to the situations that they're in. Um, that's really important for me to be able to do in my line of work. Um, but I think that, for example, Brian is someone who is not going to ever get served adequately by the clinic that he was going to, because at the time I had no expertise on most aspects of his life and didn't know how to acknowledge that clinically because I was not being given that kind of supervision. I was almost getting this sort of like meta response from my clinicians of the response that I felt I was giving to him of... Like, we can't help you here. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's often not something directly spoken, but it's this idea of like throwing your hands up because you don't know everything there is to know about blackness as a white, you know? Um, so if you're able to move through that sort of self-defeating stage um, or defense, then you're able to arrive at a place where you can understand that working across difference is not impossible um, and in fact can be very productive if you're willing to be wrong and you're willing to build trust and you're willing to like acknowledge the limits of your own understanding um, in more transparent ways than I think psychoanalysis often uh, encourages clinicians to operate. I, I, so there's, there's a lot of excitement on the chat that seems to be sort of- Ooh, So there is. Yes, I'm like, I'm trying to read as I'm speaking, but I can't. <laughs> well, the, um, um, part of what I really want to highlight is that a lot of the questions are really talking about what whiteness is doing, what the function of whiteness is, how whiteness unfolds. Um, so I want to invite, um, you know, Griselda has made a few comments. So Griselda, I'm wondering if you would be willing to sort of step in to the mic and sort of share some of your thoughts. Um, you know, particularly your first comment was about um sort of shifting the anxiety towards whiteness makes it more tangible to white supervisors rather than about mm -hmm. you know anxieties about race or about not knowing and i heard some of your comments brianna reflect that um but you've also um resulted brought up a few other comments and so i wonder if you want to share into the group aloud part of what you're thinking well i don't, I don't know if i have much to say but just everything brianna that you're talking about is making me um, both imagine what your experience must have been like, um, and also think about my own experiences, um, in supervision, um, and just like a lot of like visceral body feelings have been coming up in thinking about this and both in terms of like that shifting of like the initial anxiety that I went into the supervision room and then having that anxiety shift to having it be about anxious about being in the presence of my supervisor and or anxious about something that they're telling me I'm anxious about. Um, and just how uh, in, a, in a profession that like necessitates that we be in our body um, a lot of the times, even when it's uncomfortable, how this, um, disembodies us and then also like and therefore takes away our tool that we have and so it's like we're being told to harness a tool and we're being ripped of our tool at the same time mm -hmm. yeah no I think a lot of what you're saying resonates with um like things that I would love to like keep writing and thinking about um mainly because I think one of the questions that I saw from you in the chat really, really just like struck me, um, which is the idea that I think often bringing up race or identity, whether it's about similarity or difference as a person of color can be viewed as taking the conversation off topic somehow, or like moving away from like the valuable psychoanalytic knowledge and thinking that's supposed to be done in supervision. 
um, as opposed to understanding it as complementary or even essential to a lot of the valuable psychoanalytic thinking that can be done in supervision. Um, and I think that, you know, related to your ideas about um, the ways that this is also very embodied, like that also rings true. Like I'm a person who doesn't cry ever. Um, and every time I brought this case to an individual supervision, I would cry after. Um, and in group settings, um, two different group settings that I brought this to with colleagues, mostly white colleagues, uh, I cried after both of those or during both of those. Um, so that's really telling. Like my, my physical reaction was communicating something really important to me about like I either affect that I wasn't able to like bring into the actual room with my client or affect that was being like put on me from somewhere else, you know? Yeah, I'm just thinking as you say that about like how many people on this chat and off I have cried with at psychoanalytic conferences for this exact reason. And mm -hmm. Like every yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. About an image of whiteness as an oozy invasive substance that takes over everything. You're a clinician just like me. I don't see a racial identity. Um, see it and truly acknowledging it would require reckoning with what I have not grappled with and don't want to grapple with because it would take me to the territory of where I'm not the expert, right? Mm -hmm. and or there's like a decentering, right, of who the expert is. Um, and, you know, there are other comments that also sort of talked about colonization as part of that, like that process. We're talking also about anti-blackness as part of this process, right, that are things that help maintain the structures of whiteness and the sort of dynamics of power that you outline in your paper, right? The, the, the body is letting you know that something is shifting around power, but because you are disembodied, right, mm -hmm. you are extracted from, you are repositioned, there's no way to access what you already know, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is a question, I mean, I, I, well, do you want to reflect upon that actually? Brianna? Yeah, briefly. I mean, first of all, thank you for your summary, um, because I'm like so eager to like read the chat afterward and get all of the individual thoughts, but it's helpful to have someone who can summarize and synthesize. Um, I am thinking a lot about that specifically as it relates to the ways that like, you know, the, the gap between the body and the mind um, often allows for this like unhelpful, in my opinion, idea that, oh, we're like a community of minds thinking about this thing um, and that our minds are not at all attached to our identity or the way that we are physically perceived. Um, so, you know, I think that this relates back to my feeling of being pulled into whiteness, that when I'm sitting in a room with a supervisor and we're talking and we're not thinking about bodies in any way, it's very easy for me to feel incredibly disconnected from like who I am as a person sitting across from my supervisor versus who she is as a person sitting across from me. What other iterations historically and culturally, like the two types of bodies that we have would be sitting in a room together and the ways that like those particular histories and contexts like are in the room with us and in our bodies with us but are not things that get talked about when we think of ourselves only as two minds in conversation mm -hmm. I'm also scanning everyone. It's interesting to sort of scan to see what people's bodies or faces are doing or not doing. Um, and it's also been interesting to notice sort of like the moments where people are sort of chuckling or laughing. Um, and most of where I've noticed that has actually been in some of the more painful kinds of moments that I see resonance, right? Mm. Sort of like um, a moment where yeah, you were talking about uh, your experience in supervision around um, the mutt comment. And there was sort of like, anger explicitly on people's faces but there were other times where there was like a, a sort of laugh of identification with mm -hmm. some of the ridiculousness of what you experienced but in that moment that affect the the disbelief of it was completely cut off right so there's mm -hmm. something about coloniality and disembodiment that you know and i said in the beginning i'm thinking about colonialism more and more right and th that the disembodiment is a key part of maintaining these positions of power you know mm -hmm. they, commented about sort of themes of inadequacy for, for the mm -hmm. white folks of not knowing. And I think we're talking about the way that the body is a cue 
uh, when, mm -hmm. when. Um, there is a question I also want to highlight um, that uh, just Joseph was asking. Uh, I'd love to hear more about what you imagine creative and radical disclosure, specifically with Brian, but more broadly in therapeutic relation could bring. And so I want to sure. think a little bit about that in this case with, with Brian, right? That there's actually mm -hmm. a lot of things that you come to know over time that you couldn't know quite then. And that's part of the disembodiment and part of being interpolated or colonized in your training environment. Um, so from where you're, where you're coming from now, what are some of the things that you might imagine you could have done in this mm -hmm. case to speak with Brian, to engage Brian in treatment? What totally. are some of the things you might have, you know, this idea of radical disclosure? I'm wondering if you can Sure. Um, so I will preface this by saying that Mamta and I are working um, on uh, a, a session for Division 39. And I have a whole case for my current job where like the entire focus of this paper is inevitably going to be on disclosure. Um, because like the way that I operate now is like telling clients I have a dog, telling clients, you know, things that I think are very much seen as like shameful to admit that you've disclosed. Um, you know, I think um, in my training environment, there was a lot of, um, anxiety that I that I felt about even being paired with working with this client because I felt like walking into a room with someone who physically looked like me and looked un, like in an uncanny way like my younger brother like there was this way of of um understanding like the act of walking into a therapy room with him as being like somehow a problem um and it wasn't because I had any control over how I looked. It was just that I was walking into a room with Brian um, and he saw me and I saw him and it felt inevitable that like I needed to address that in some way. Um, with, him? I, with, with him? With him. With him. With him. Like, in the treatment. I think it would have felt like a disservice to not offer him a space at least once, not even, you know, early on, but, you know, sort of in an ongoing way to, to process what it meant for him to be different from me, um, while also resembling me and being curious about what, what those gaps and what those convergences meant for the work that we could do together as two individuals. Um, with him, I think there, you know, are moments where, for example, when he's talking about this dog, like I easily could have had a conversation with him about what it meant to have a dog for him and what it meant for me to be thinking about getting a dog at the time. Um, and even like very small things like that, I think lead us to really interesting places in clinical like dialogue. Um, there's a lot of moments like that where I think, um, thinking about the heaviness of certain disclosures like you know whether i'm going to tell him that i too was raised by a single white mom in the first session is i think not what i'm talking about what i'm talking about is like being comfortable with the part of being a clinician that sometimes involves making decisions about whether or not you tell someone that you live or have a familiarity with the neighborhood that they grew up in or that you know there's some connection between you and this other person um that then is you know the ball is in their court to suss out how much of um that connection they feel is is resonating um i think leaving the power in the client's hands to say like yes or no like this is working or this isn't working in terms of what you've offered is something that like gets built over time right and i think working with him there was not time to do any of that. Um, but I think that if I had felt less compelled to operate from this um, like blank screen, um, you can't know anything about me um, because I'm your therapist stance that was, I think very uh, implicitly and explicitly being encouraged. Um, perhaps there would have been a greater sense of safety for Brian because I can now imagine myself as someone who transmitted a lot of the feelings of anxiety that my supervisors had about me and about him um onto him directly um there was this way that i was like because i was pulled into whiteness acting as like a sort of vehicle 
um, for a lot of the not knowing anxieties, I think that were present about this client um, among my supervisors. So Jess, you, Jessica, you asked this, this question. I'm wondering if you wanna share with us any reflections back or further questions that come up for you. Can folks hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. Okay. Um, thank you for that, um, Brenna. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny because like I asked a question as I was reading the paper. I feel like so much of the time when I'm asking things about this quote unquote disclosure, and I really appreciated like Jody's comment about like the objectification and dehumanizing, dehumanizing that comes with that word. But I think so many times it's just to kind of like throw out my fear that the ways that I relate to the clients or the patients I work with in this human way is like not wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or not, I'm not fucking it up. And um, just like hearing kind of your humanness and like being a person who has a dog with the people they work with was just like really warming. And I just wanted to hear more about your experience with it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'll briefly say that like in my oh, current well, job, I can't, I can't hear you. But maybe it's because I don't have my headphones in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me know if you're good. Thumbs up? Yes? Okay, great. Um, so I, I think what I'll just say about, like, the setting that I'm in now is that it very much, um, re like, in some ways is, is ideal for uh, psychoanalytic practice because it relies on me um, working with people in a jail, like, visiting people in a jail where they're deprived of a lot of human contact and there are no windows and um like sitting with them and talking about the fact that I don't really have control over their case and like what else can we talk about like what can I learn about you and what can you learn about me that makes this experience like more bearable for you given that it's like constructed to be unbearable um like I think that that environment uh, like in a lot of ways has led me to be more comfortable with self-disclosure. Um, and I can imagine people making arguments for why I should share less about myself too. But um, I think it's incredibly important for clients who are in a lot of ways uh, deprived of basic things. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, Brian is someone who also falls into that category. Like I have this like really sad fantasy of like him being a client at my current job um but just understanding that like it's not it's not harmful or overwhelming for my client to know that I'm a dog person um and, and like in a lot of ways like it then leads to this like point of safety for my client to return to when we're talking about his case and he doesn't want to talk about it and then he can ask me about my dog instead um so like having um this like generous understanding of disclosure as something that I think often protects um, the therapeutic dyad is something that uh, I would love to think and write more about. Um, because I think that the way that we've understood it is actually very paternalistic to clients in um, constructing them as people who uh, can't handle knowing information about us when in actuality, if they want to, then they can also like Google us and find out probably plenty. <laughs> So there's two more kind of themes of questions coming up and I want to kind of to the group check in about timing you know, we've been on the call almost an hour so I'm just going to be mindful of people's energies and where we are. Um, it's slated for 90 minutes but I'll be tracking folks and feel free to send me a message if anything is happening. Um, so one, one theme that seems to be coming up is that there's people are talking a little bit about the sort of affective response. I think it was um, uh, Nancy was talking a little bit about like the rage and frustration that comes up when this human capacity to be talking about what's really happening in people's lives is not considered analytic enough. And there's comments sort of speaking to, it's actually a very particular kind of psychoanalytic. And I'm reflecting on some of the conversations I've had with folks who reject psychoanalytic thinking because of the sort of perception of psychoanalysis as the sort of really classic blank slate kind of psychoanalysis. And so I'm wondering, you know, this is a little more theoretical a little bit, Brianna, but I'm wondering, you know, you're talking about some of what client offers around racial loneliness and some of the processes in that. And I'm just curious about what your thoughts are about where psychoanalysis specifically is alive in these kinds of, you know, conversations. When people talk about disclosure, it feels like a departure 
from psychoanalytic thinking, but in what ways I think we're beginning, we are talking about in what ways that is actually part of a psychoanalytic. Right. And right. so I'm, I'm... That's, a, that's a really good theoretical question that I like admittedly will need to think more on. Um, but I think, you know, part of the reason that I like Klein um, is because in a lot of ways, um, my understanding is very much like this, um, I don't know, like it's, it's coming. Nancy, I think you're sharing your screen with the group. So there's like a share screen button at the bottom from what you did, or I think. So I'm just letting you know that that's happening. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think that, um, in a lot of ways, I really like Klein because Klein, interestingly, was like an accessible person for me to read and access. And I think like Klein's womanhood among like the canon of like male psychoanalytic theorists is interesting to me and I need to know more about it. I don't claim to know quite a lot, but um, I think understanding myself as someone who can actually through disclosure sometimes provide nuance or help people move toward a like depressive position understanding of myself as an object for them um is something that i like love like i love being able to think like that that like it's not it's not about me being a good or bad object to someone um and it's not about me assuming that this person is only capable of understanding things in good or bad because i think that leads us back to the dichotomy of who's the expert and who's not or who's the white person and who's the black person um, but I think that the fact that, like, Klein arrives at this understanding of nuance um, as being, like, a, a healthy place to be and one that we can slip into and out of, like, really makes me excited. Um, and I think that there are ways that that can be translated to a macro level as well. When we, like, have difficulty understanding multi multiracial people, like, what is that saying about our understanding of, like, whiteness as good and all else as bad? Um, so I'm excited by Klein. I think I I have uh, actually pretty limited understanding of a lot of other psychoanalytic theory and I'm eager to learn more. Um, I think I'm like not eager enough to like pay tuition <laughs> anywhere to learn that. But if anyone does want to think more about it with me or share things with me, like by all means, you all will hopefully have my email after this. And like, I think conversations about what is happening in the world of psychoanalytic theory that's being created now um, is, is like a big point of curiosity for me. Can, can I add a brief coda to that? Um, yes. Two quick Klein things. So I, I also live for Melanie Klein. Um, <laughs> in, sort of at the center of all my work. And I think it's not a coincidence that mm -hmm. those who really care about race in psychoanalysis, love Klein, right? There's a reason you talk about Klein. There's a reason that people like um, Fakhri Davids in his book, Internal Racism, draws a lot on a Kleinian framework. It's because racism is really Kleinian, right? Mm -hmm. And so there, there's a way in which like, I really do think we need to like, we as people of color working in these spaces need to like reimagine and remake these tools and like, you know, in, reinvent the book that Erwin Hoffman says we have to throw away sometimes like you did and like we all do. But the, the thing I would say to white clinicians um, and is that there's a very classical piece of Klein that is essential, which is that Klein demands that we recognize our own aggression, right? And I, I really feel strongly that if, that that's like so much of what your case is about is the disavowal of white aggression and like white people's inability to reckon with their own aggression. And that if we're gonna make progress as a professional community, we really need to like remind people about this thing that they theoretically already know, which is that you need to be attentive to your own aggression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, that um, I'm like seeing the chat happen too. And, you know, I think uh, like trying to, trying to like weave things together in my mind. But I think that related to this question of aggression, like there's, um, I think it's interesting to me that disclosure is this, like, like you were saying, mom, so this, this, this real de departure from like how we understand other aspects of psychoanalytic practice. Um, and I think the question that always sort of comes up is like, who benefits from a disclosure? Um, 
But I think that like that question is almost unfairly posed when we're talking specifically about disclosure as opposed to literally any other technique. Like people are not asking that question about, uh, you know, the choice to like let the client open the door or not in the same level of like anxiety response. Like I think people have anxiety about disclosure because disclosure implicates power and identity in ways that psychoanalysis for a long time has not been able to. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think it's just important to name that like the reason that disclosure is an issue is because it's about who we are um, and what we're choosing to bring in, um, which is inevitably a risk. Like it's a risk for two people to be sitting in a room talking about anything. Um, and I don't think that disclosure deserves the level of like scrutiny or anxiety that often comes with it. I'm feeling so, um, stirred up by all the different kinds of comments. And so it's sort of, uh, I'm glad all of you can sort of see the many different directions that our minds are heading in. Um, and I feel honestly like a little bit of <clears throat> split feelings about in which direction to head next. Um, I think I saw a question um, come up. You know, it seems like we're talking about white aggression, white fragility, power dynamics, and how power sort of shows up in terms of again, sort of how whiteness continues to be centered in the conversation around power. Um, mm -hmm. And then earlier when I made a comment about sort of what happens when we decenter whiteness, right? There's something that gets scattered and fractured that then um, systems and folks in positions of power and institutions don't quite really know how to show up. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this, these comments, right, about how white aggression really, I mean, it seems like white aggression is really getting people stirred up, right, to actually mm -hmm. mean um, white supremacy and white aggression as something that is showing up very actively in analytic spaces and analytic theory. And in despite our sort of efforts to undo it or to challenge it, it seems like um, there's still something so sticky about it, right? Mm -hmm. it used to make itself um, the center point. Whiteness continues to try to make itself the center point. Right. And I think the one thing that I, I feel like I can say about white aggression as it relates to this specific clinical example um, is that I think white aggression showed up not in my supervisor's response to me, but in my supervisor's response to Brian. Like, there was this sense from all three of my older white female supervisors that Brian was not going to show up to therapy, um, that he was like not someone who I should have high expectations for. Um, and I think when we use the word aggression, like it is a word that is like inevitably attached to concrete actions um, and often like violent actions. Um, but I think that the idea of aggression as something that can happen verbally and something that can happen through projections um, or through like comments, I think that were, you know, intended to make me feel better. Um, right. There's like, there's ways that like language in and of itself um, and how we choose to conceptualize some clients versus other clients um, is this experience of um, like violence. Um, and is this experience of, I, I think, like coloniality in a lot of ways, because like the discourses that we're creating about particular types of clients or the typologies of clients that we're creating um, often serve um, to, in so many ways, like set the trajectory of what treatment can be. Like my expectations of what I could do with Brian were so incredibly curtailed by my supervisor's early comments about him not being someone who I should expect to show up. Um, and then that was doubled down on when my client was called a mutt in supervision um, because it set the tone for who I was supposed to be and who he was supposed to be um, in a way that was aggressive. Like that was being done for me and to me um, without allowing me to have a role in setting like my own frame for what the treatment could be with him. I think I also see 
some of the white aggression in um, the the refusal to recognize you as a color. Right. right? That, that, I mean, is is so, it's confusing to me, right, as somebody who sits with you and works with you and talks with you, right, that that could, mm -hmm. that, that could be so deeply whitened in that system. Mm -hmm. And so I, I also see the aggression coming towards you, even though it was explicitly directed towards your client. Right. That makes sense. And I think like the conversation about white fragility that's happening in the comments too, like is, um, I am like trying to do this on my phone. So someone who we can name, maybe Mamta can name, gave a really helpful perspective that I think white aggression and white fragility are intertwined often because the effect of someone being white in a fragile way is often to demand or divert care and attention that is otherwise going toward other vulnerable people who are on the bottom or the receiving end of power and violence. Um, like that, that care and attention that would go to those folks is then being diverted back to the white person in the conversation or in the room. Um, which I think was very much what ended up happening later on with one of my supervisors, you know, like she had a whole conversation with me about the organization. I had talked about how I felt out of place at the organization and how it was difficult for me to know what was going on with this client because I didn't really feel like I was getting a lot of good insights on him, maybe because of some racial things. And like that felt like a big risk for me. Um, but instead of talking about the case, which is why I had brought this up, uh, the rest of the supervision hour became about her asking me questions about what it was like to be a person of color at my agency. Um, and at the end of the conversation, she said, thank you for educating me. Um, and like, I'm the one paying social work school tuition. I'm the one not getting paid to work at this internship. And I'm the one coming to you with questions about my cases for supervision. <laughs> so the fact that I was then like put in this role without even realizing it almost until the end, like leads me to this, like, I, I guess, uh, place of understanding now even more about the comment around whiteness being this like oozing substance that's everywhere. Um, that then like in some ways like muddles the, the clarity that I think I came into, for example, that supervision session with, like I knew what I wanted out of the supervision session and then I wasn't able to get it because of the existing dynamics of how I relate to whiteness. Um, and what was being asked of me. There's people making comments other than that, like fragility and aggression, like it's taking the attention and it's doing all these moves, but it also is inviting a reaction from people of color where like, what's the choice we have in, like in the Goffman sense, right? Of like, what kind of lines can we take and give? Like, could we, we can either be like, oh, oops, sorry and feed into it or we can be like no what if, hey what are you doing and then we're owning their aggression mm -hmm. and is complete mm -hmm. and it's right. like no with this is my thing about the institutions right and that you bring up in the paper like without institutional change that like that that's it like mm -hmm. there's no way around right i can see anyway right because you're put into a bind from not any one white person's decision making or conscious or unconscious response, but instead from the setup of being in a system that doesn't have uh, a way of understanding, trying to understand or valuing experiences that fall outside of a white norm. Mm -hmm. And I think we're also, a uh, private comment came to me, I think we're also mixing up, not mixing up, but need to see that this is something that happens both interpersonally as well as institutionally. So, mm -hmm. so the possibilities of any pushback not only happen between you and your supervisor and what happens in that hour and then what is imaginable for you in your work in an ongoing way, but then it's also about what the institutional practices are, who gets mm -hmm. sort of rewarded or promoted for speaking in a particular way. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we can think a little bit more about what some of those more institutional practices are that push against any effort to decenter whiteness. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think one of the like easiest examples um, is the fact that a white 
trans clinician who like spoke frequently about gender and gender identity like was given uh a talk um this is someone who was at the same training stage as me um and was just afforded like lots of praise and attention for asking questions about gender and gender identity in our case consultation meetings during the same year where you know i took that as a signal that oh this is an okay place for me to ask those questions about race um and then felt very much like excluded and in some ways like i guess punished for asking those questions and stepping out of line and like being a problem person who was taking clinical conversations off track. So I think that those sorts of things are really insidious and hard to identify uh, in the moment. And like, I'm having that realization now, two years later, about like the ways that certain, certain behaviors coming from certain people are rewarded um, and are seen as problems in other people. I think you're muted, Mamta. Uh, that's also very interesting. You're saying it this way when we're talking about institutional practices and the sort of um, realization that's coming after the fact, because that's also the theme that's starting to emerge in the chat right now mm. about the deep delay in terms of understanding how power has sort of um, interpolated, not, but, but like quarantined you in some way, right? Away from these learning opportunities. And some of the conversation is about how these realizations aren't necessarily happening in real time. Mm -hmm. Right, but that potential like dissociation and confusion that then uh, leads to recognition later. You know, it's mm -hmm. time to that disembodiment. Mm -hmm. um, and I really appreciate this comment from Christina about that the white fragility and even white aggression is really effective at projecting it into POC, right? And that's part of what that dissociation seems to right. be. It's the sort of particular way that power gets distributed. Mm -hmm. um, and pathologizing. Sounds like, yeah. Leilani posed a question in here too. Um, how white aggression can incite dissociation in POC. Might this be a defense against the chaos experienced by, by whiteness that gets projected into POC? It seems mm -hmm. like this theme of dissociation that, that, that happened and then you know, you've been talking about how this case has unfolded for you over mm -hmm. years, right? It's mm -hmm. like uh, out of this dissociative, you know, disembodied, extracted kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like one of the interesting things about working with this client is that like he was incredibly affectively numbed um, and would often like induce that numbing with like Xanax or marijuana. Um, and that was like a very like, you know, under discussed component of my work in trying to understand him in our first few sessions in supervision because, you know, asking questions about race felt like that like derailed my other my other ability to get through any other topic in supervision. But um, I do think it's interesting that you know this was like Brian's choice uh, in terms of how to like manage. Um, whatever was going on in his life in or outside of therapy and like you know he would come to therapy like after having taken Xanax because that's what he needed to be able to tolerate like walking into the clinic mm -hmm. um, and like I think that there were ways that um, my own level of like scatteredness um, or my own level of um, not understanding why I was crying, not really being able to like speak in any meaningful way about my emotions with anyone at my internship, like allowed for this like parallel between the client and myself in very different contexts to like feel after the fact or um, to not feel because that was a safer option um, at the time. Like I think understanding ourselves as people who um are making conscious and unconscious like choices all the time about what's protective and what's productive um and that you know for myself often uh getting caught off guard by the tears that would be like flowing 
um, was probably a result of like some protective mechanism internally uh, to not have to deal with the feelings of um, shame and anxiety and inadequacy um, and, you know, visibility and dismissal also being wrapped up in there. Like those dynamics were things that like I, I had to sit down at the end of my training year and write into this paper um, because it wasn't possible to access any of those in the moment except for the tears. I'm like following along on the chat. Yeah, I'm just reading some back channel questions that are coming. Great. Um, as well. Um, All praise to Leilani Savo Crane for the nonstop fire contributions in this conversation. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, I think that that's like the biggest chicken and egg question of like, we need more supervisors and mentors of color, but we have to make sure that like, inviting them in is not a horrible process um for them <laughs> um yeah i mean i think that griselda's experience is common too of like you know my supervisor emailed me at the end of the training year um i'm sorry i'm in brooklyn and someone is honking their horn really loud outside my window um the idea that the idea that you have to outsource the problem um, is, I think, a really common one that very much um, goes back to this idea of white anxiety about not being the expert. Um, and I think, like my approach with this client was very much, I have a lot to learn from him. I don't know him. I want to ask him more, and I want to explore with him, like what it means for us to be two very different people who maybe are lumped in by this organization. Um, because I think that that's a block that needs to that needs to be worked through in order for us to do any other therapeutic work like that was not something that my supervisors seemed to be able to tolerate um, <laughs> and therefore it wasn't something I could tolerate and therefore it was something I transmitted back to the client um, so I appreciate that experience that you brought up um, as one that like isn't really productive for anybody um, mm -hmm. it like it doesn't afford a supervisor an opportunity to not be the expert and like continue growing as a clinician it doesn't allow a supervisee to have the experience of like bringing personal expertise into supervision in a way that doesn't feel taxing um and it also like obviously does a disservice to i'm saying client because of my job now but the patient um who's not being given i think um what I would consider to be like a better informed level of care that they're entitled to. So there's sort of two comments and then, uh, and I think we're gonna have to move towards wrapping up, but I really mm -hmm. appreciate it. Um, one person is asking, and I actually think this is something you've been speaking to about what the traps are, is about how do you actually then come back in supervisory relationship and say, hey, this happened last time. Like for example, when your supervisor used the whole session to ask you about your experience as being a person of color at this institution, right? Like, mm -hmm. is there a spaciousness to talk about that? So that's one question, which if you could make a brief comment or two about, and then maybe mm -hmm. that, that could be something that we follow up more directly um, with, with the person. And then the other comment that came to me that I really want to emphasize um, speaks to how, like, the, the, and I think we were speaking to this theme, is that the conversation about whiteness and about white fragility um, continues to speak to, continues to center the conversation around a response to whiteness. Mm -hmm. right? Over and over and over again. And I think that that's just something really important for us to um, be observing, right? Is that when we're speaking about white aggression, we're speaking about white fragility, it seems to me like a perpetual place of remaining in a colonized, position right like where where mm -hmm. there's sort of is there a way and i don't know if there is to sort of be is to remove yourself from this framework given the sort mm -hmm. of, breath of colonialism the breath of white supremacy is it is it that we will perpetually be in reaction to and mm -hmm. as POC and need to be thinking that way or is there actually a different kind of framework that's possible mm -hmm. and i just right. think those, they're both really big questions that seem to be, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Any thoughts right. you want to about that? And then we'll move towards closing up and sure. Going. Sure. No, I mean, I think relative to the second point, um, I, I feel like the article that was just referenced by Linda is a really good one. Um, the white supremacy culture article, um, which like isn't new, but is also outside of the psychoanalytic canon. So is probably not super widely used. Um, but it, I think relies very heavily on the idea of like understanding all of the things that we take for granted in a professional workplace, for example, um, as often being related to like practices of upholding white supremacy, um, which I think like is not an intentional thing, but is like the norm that like makes sense to maintain because it's comfortable and it works well enough for many of us. Um, and so I think that, you know, even in thinking about how I could revisit a conversation with a supervisor, like I, I don't know that I want to, <laughs> um, because I think that like, that's an okay place to arrive, like to understand that my supervisors taught me a lot and offered me a lot. And also like, if I don't want to revisit that with them, like that's an okay place to be, um, is sort of where I'm at. Um, and I think that that like could change over time, but I think especially coming from like not being compensated, um, and not having this client to even work with anymore. Um, I, I didn't feel like it, I felt like the cost was greater than the potential benefit. Um, and I think that that's something that could absolutely change if I, you know, had continued working with this client on an ongoing basis. Maybe it would have felt like I had more of a stake in trying to work through this dynamic with my supervisors. Um, but I ended up getting a lot of white clients and uh, also just not talking about my clients of color with my three white supervisors, which I think was a loss for everybody. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, like, I'll also add on, Brianna, to this that, like, um, I appreciate that that happened there with your sort of supervisory experience, but I also think speaking to this question of what to do with the supervisor is that there's like a, for, for me and my own experience is a continual repetition of that, whether mm -hmm. it was a supervisor or this institution, or even recently I applied to a supervision training program and experienced the exact same thing I experienced during my graduate training around rejecting me because of how I was speaking about race and mm -hmm. then to too far in the know and closed off to learning, which, which is the, it's such a repetition. And so I think there could be space to develop something with the supervisor, but I, I also want to speak to the sort of structural reenactment that happens over and over again. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty of coping that you're talking about, which is to sort of move, move away from trying to find that as the site of repair. Mm -hmm. um, which is question of where is the site of repair then? Exactly, exactly. So yeah. there's so much more for us to talk about in, in all of this. And, you know, I'm, I'm toggling between two screens because my sound crapped out in the middle of, of the conversation. So I'm like, where, who am I looking at where? But, um, but I think part of, part of what this really demonstrates is that there's actually quite a bit more conversation to have about this. And so, um, you know, on one hand, there's a desire to sort of summarize and wrap up. And then I also feel like this is a very incomplete conversation. And so there's certain themes that each of us are walking away with, you know, thinking about themes of you know, white aggression, white supremacy, what is centered, what does decentering whiteness look like? You know, what are the, the institutional practices around power that, that perpetuate um, everything you're talking about? And then what does clinical supervision and training look like, you know, for those mm -hmm. of us who moving into the fields in different ways, how do we unearth and unseat these practices? Mm -hmm. um, but I also feel like what an in, uh, incomplete summary, right, of what is the beginning of a conversation. And mm -hmm. so for now, you know, I'd like to, if there's any closing comments you would like to offer to the group um, or you, Carter, I'd like to offer that. And then um, maybe Jane and Jessica can speak to us then about sort of any next steps or future directions um, for this meeting or um, future section nine conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm just very happy to see that the chat has been so active on uh, this conversation. Um, and I, I think um, I'm leaving with a lot more ideas about what to write and think about. Um, 
and I'm very excited to have seen so many like classmates and colleagues um, who were able to join and participate and offer up their experiences, um, which I think is like often a risky thing to do in such a large group. So I really appreciate the fact that I was able to walk away from this conversation feeling supported and challenged and um, in ways that are so much more growth oriented um, and productive, I think, than a lot of the things that I wrote about in my paper. So I'm very grateful. Thank, we, we thank you. Just, oh, go ahead, Carter. Sorry. No, just, this is what we want section nine to be. You know, like this is like, this is the heart of what we want this, the culture of this institution to be like, these are the conversations we want. These are the people we want in the room, like more of this. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brianna, for sharing your paper and um, just, you know, for putting yourself out there in this way. It's been really an amazing conversation. And I really appreciate how we, I think, in this conversation, got to talking about how structural racism impacts our bodies and our minds and our work. And yeah, I echo Carter that this is what I dreamed of for these kinds of discussions. So. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, I, um, I'm just um, grateful for you sharing your paper also given that it's not published and I would love to see it in print too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I'm saying I'm happy to say that I am like working on trying to publish a version of this paper. But in the meantime, I think my goal, uh, I got an email about this earlier today from someone, but if there are clinicians, particularly young clinicians of color who are interested in engaging with this as a theme, or you think might relate to some of these ideas, please feel free to send it to them anyways. Um, I'm like not an academic and not particularly invested in what it means for a paper to be published or not right now. And so if this in any way like could resonate with people, I think it's more important to me that it's shared with them uh, whether it's published or not. So feel free to forward to colleagues or supervisees.